God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zakur the son of Imri. And next unto them repaired Merumoth, the son of Urajia, the son of Koz, Koz, and next unto them repaired Mishilam, the son of Bekariah, the son of Meshzabil. Next unto them repaired Zadok, the son of Bana. Moreover, the old gate repaid Jehoiada, the son of Pasea, and Meshulam, the son of Besodia. They laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. Next unto them repaired Uziel, the son of Harhaya, of the goldsmiths. Next unto them also repaired Hananiah, the son of one of the apothecaries, and they fortified Jerusalem unto the broad wall. And next unto them repaired. This is over, right? Ten. Oh, ten. And next unto them repaired Jediah, the son of Haruma, even over against his house. And next unto them repaired Hatush, the son of Hashbania. Verse eleven. The valley gate repaired Hanuk, and the inhabitants of Zanoia, they built it, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof, and a thousand cubits on the walls unto the dung gate, verse 14. But the dung gate repaired Malchiah, the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of Methacherem, he built it, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. Let's read verse 15 together. But the gate of the fountain repaid Shalon, son of Paul Hosea, the ruler of part of Mizpah. He built it and covered it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof, and the wall of the pool of Shalom by the king's garden and unto the states that go down from the city of David. Okay, let's pray and look unto the Lord. Dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, we praise you for giving us this time, Lord. Lord, I pray and ask that you be with me and be with all of us, Lord. Give me, Lord, the spirit and your utterance so that I can speak uh, what you have in store for your children, Lord. May your grace be upon me and speak through me, Lord. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. In these uh, few verses, we see the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Rebuilding of the walls. The walls signify, represent... Um, the salvation, our salvation. We read that in few places, I think uh, brothers have covered it already, but we'll read some of the verses in um, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 18 says, the walls of salvation and the gates, gates of praise. What it means is, walls represent the salvation of our um, God's people. Walls of salvation and gates of praise. 
In other places also, 51 verse 18 says, Build thou, thou the walls of salvation. In um, Psalm 51 verse 18, talking about the same thing. Speaking about the security that a wall uh, provides to a believer. If you don't have the walls, what it means is um, you are open to your enemy. The, your enemy can come in so easily if your walls are broken. Proverbs 25, 28 says that there is no rule over his spirit whose walls are broken. Okay, so if your walls of your uh, spiritual um, life is broken down, then um, you don't have any control over your spirit. But those whose walls are secure, then it relates to your salvation, that you are secure in the Lord. In a sense, when you have walls, it also relates to the church and um, how you are secure in the Lord. It, when you have your walls built, then um, the, the life of the church is very healthy when you have your walls secured. So that's what it means. And um, if your walls are broken, then you're prone to the attacks of the devil and, um, and various kinds of attacks. So walls also keep good people in and keep bad people out. It's a separation of God's kingdom and God's people be and the world that's outside that's been um, uh, influenced by the devil and the, and the spirit of Antichrist. Also walls um, give, if your walls are good, then it gives us a sense of protection from all danger. It represents security and protection from the power of sin from the power of the devil and from the, the world influence. I just mentioned it as it gives power from the three S. First is it gives us overcoming power from sin. Second one is from Satan. Third one is from the spirit of the world so that you can remember it. So if you have your walls secured, if you have, if you have your walls built, then um, you have this power to overcome sin, Satan, and the spirit. Though this book talks about a lot of history, we can relate the events and the, and the people and the enemies that Nehemiah had to the present Christian life. The Holy Spirit has placed certain key characters and events in this um, record that revealed to her the spiritual warfare and the walk of a believer. Okay, so it might look pretty. Uh, it looks like a historical account of all the things that are going on. When you read so many uh, people's names, right? You felt it like, why should God write so many names? Why should God record so many names? When f the when first. Anil, um, last Sunday he covered up to verse 20, chapter 2 and then chapter 3, when I looked at it, when I first read it, like I really actually panicked. <laughs> I told Anil, I'll go to verse chapter 4. <laughs> it's all talking about names of the people. What is there for me to preach here, right? It's all talking about walls and names of the people. but. One thing we have to realize is God did not just say lots of people, many, many people, lots of people build the walls of Jerusalem. With one verse he can just say that, right? Lots and lots of people build the walls of Jerusalem. He could just say that, just one verse, but God did not uh, say that because he is a faithful God. He records 
all the work of all the people that actually worked so that their memorial is kept for eternity. That's what it says. Right? So, uh, Nehemiah in um, 220 giving them a warning to the enemies Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian when they scoffed at them saying what are you doing this? Why are you rebelling against the king? Nehemiah said that the God of heaven he will give us the power he will prosper us but you will have will not have any share you will have no portion no right nor memorial in Jerusalem or in other words those that willingly helped in rebuilding the walls and contributing to the work of God's uh, ministry their work has been recorded forever in eternity. That's the reason God is very keen on the people. He records people. God is a God who records our work. The Bible tells that God is not unrighteous to forget your labor, labor of love. God is not unrighteous. Hebrews 6.10 says, God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love, especially to those, uh, especially that you have shown to God's children. So let's, um, before we continue with um, these verses, which in this passage, which give and talk about rebuilding the walls and also the ten gates that are built, that are rebuilt. We see here in this picture, those that have study Bible, you can see a picture of the ten gates that are also um, illustrated here. So, rebuilding the walls of our salvation requires effort. And not only that, when these people are building and rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, it was not um, just smooth and easy. There was opposition. There was strong opposition. So let's look at the enemies. Who are the people that are opposing? First thing is when you do some work, when you want to win a game, what you do? Good um, people who actually want to win the game, they first um, look how the opponent is actually playing, right? You have to see their um, strategy. Only then you can counter attack them. If you don't know how... So, I think Joel also mentioned once that uh, his brother-in-law used to see like um, how um, the people play, to whom like he has to play. So, he, they, he, they people, good um, sports people, they actually observe and see and look at the strategy of their opponents. Here we see that uh, in, throughout this book, we, you, we see three key um, opponents of Nehemiah and um, the God's people. Nehemiah means God comforts. Nehemiah is like a type of Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ is the one who actually uh, builds our uh, walls of salvation. And we are co-workers in his vineyard. All we need is a willing and an obedient heart. And like Nehemiah, Jesus Christ enables us to work in, for his kingdom. So the three enemies that we see here throughout this book is, first is Sanballat. Sanballat, what it means is hatred in secret. The words. I looked uh, further in what it means by Sanballat, just googled and found out that what it means is talks about a bramble bush. It's a it's a weed tree. The meaning is called bramble bush. I further looked in, into it and 
uh, to see what this bramble bush is. It's very interesting um, uh, character of this uh, weed. This tree has, um, it's a weed that has a lot of thorns in its stem, okay? And um, its leaves are also very thorny, and um, it's very uh, thorny and pricky. If you touch it accidentally, yeah, you'll get the prickiness of the of the of the weed of the tree. It, it becomes it could become very big, and it could destroy all your plants. And also, the roots get once um, the, the roots get easily, they can e they establish very easily. They get into the soil easily, but once they establish, it's they go so strong that it's not easy for you to pick, pull it out. When I read about the character of this bramble bush tree, uh, that means enemy in secret or hatred in secret, um, which is so rough and pricky and causing nuisance in the garden and also to the pets and children. All children also can get stuck to this pretty thorny tree that they can get hurt. And um, it reminds me of even in our, ga ga in our backyard where like I was able to see these kind of trees. Have you ever seen these kind of difficult uh, weeds where you can't uh, use your hands? You cannot use your hands. You have to use a special tool, gloves, or you have to use a special shoving thing. Can only remove these weeds. Special, unique. And the roots are so deep, and accidentally, once I just try to pull it up, and I got almost so pricked with all the thorns, and it's very difficult. And they are planted right next to a good tree, like a tomato tree or something like that. And you can't, um, it's going to kill the tree as well. So it reminded me of um, uh, how difficult it is to remove once they are established. Exactly, um, it means to what um, here the San Balat means is he is a person who hates God's people in secret. That's what it means in other translations. So it also means that he opposes strongly, with a strong opposition to God's people children okay there's a strong opposition you can easily guess who this enemy is in in our spiritual life this satan no no other than satan so we also see another person that's um, here we see geshem the arabian and also tobiah right so the three enemies Tobiah is also seen where he is uh, the servant of God. He says, uh, uh, Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite. He is, uh, looks like he's from the same uh, Jewish um, tribe or from the same. Uh, so he is a servant and Tobiah means Jehovah is good. That's what it means. But he also vigorously opposes God's people. As we continue to read in Nehemiah, you see the way how he opposes God's people. We can relate this to our old self, the sinful nature that is in us, that um, actually tells that, promises that we are doing good to God, but in turn actually it's a strong opposition to the work of the Lord. It always promises good. If you read Tobiah, he tries to give false promises that you do this and that and then it will work out good for you. But in fact, actually it's causing great um, harm to the work of the Lord. And the third enemy is Geshem, which is means Geshno or rain. It's like something that is tangible or something that is physical. What can we relate that is to, to the world system, the spirit of this world, is the Samaritans and the Arabians also support him. The Arabian, Arabians, speaking about the system of the world, is always 
uh, against the work of the Lord. Anything that you want to do for God, anything that you want to do according to God's will, there is always the spirit of opposition uh, coming from the worldly people. Just go to India or some place and um, try to give some, um, try to start some voluntary uh, work for orphans. You think uh, uh, people who are around you, the reason why I'm telling India is because you have a lot of friends who will give you free advice. You don't have to, they'll come home and give you lots of advice that you don't even ask, right? They are friends, they just come and say, do that, do this, say, if you have money, put it in this stock or put it in this, do this business and that business and so many things, they'll just come and keep telling us. So they give advice and when you tell that I'm going to open up an orphanage and I'm going to give the money or I'm going to no, no, why are you doing this? Why are you like? Why are you wasting your money? All these kinds of this because the worldly system opposes God's work. So it's interesting when you go back to San Bata, uh, San Balat, um, Paul also talks about that um, in Ephesians he says that um, stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse um, 11, he says that um, he is aware of the schemes of the devil. He is well aware of the schemes of the devil. He says, verse 10 onwards, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also for... If I forgive anything to whom I forgave, for you, your sakes forgive I, it is in person of Christ. So here Paul is talking about forgiveness. And there is a reason why Paul wants to forgive. In the next verse, he says, Lest Satan should take advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul is saying that. Are you and me, are we fully aware of the schemes and the strategies of the devil? So that we can stand against his schemes and devils. Why is Paul connecting this forgiveness to um, the attacks and the schemes of the devil? Saying that he, well, we are well aware of schemes of the devil. Let's also read another one from Second Peter. Sorry, not Second Peter. Actually, it's uh, First Peter, chapter three. An advice to husbands, verse seven. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto your wife as unto a weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life. Here, there is a reason why he's saying that your prayers be not hindered. Again, Paul is saying that you have to have a right relationship with your wife <clears throat> in the family. <coughs> Husband and wife should submit to one another, should have this loving relationship, lest your prayers be hindered. How is this related to our prayers related? Because there is a spiritual connection to all these things, especially there if we don't do cert if you do certain things and don't do certain things, your spiritual life is impacted. I was reading um, uh, Screw Screwtap Letters by C.S. Lewis, and I shared some of um, the the interesting points from last time. For but it's very interesting. I would like to share some of his thoughts. So in Screwtap Letters. C.S. Lewis is a great man of God, and uh, he he has very uh, very powerful um, points, uh, spiritual points for us to learn. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia and other things, and um, he writes these screw tab letters where a senior devil gives advice to an, to his nephew or a junior devil, right? So he he writes letters to him giving advice how you should actually bring um, 
humans, okay, I'm talking in their terms, okay, he, he gives a negative message so that we can, from the negative message, we can get the positive. And in the, in the, in this, the uncle, he's called uncle, is called, his name is Screwtape. So he writes to Wormwood saying that, dear Wormwood, so in this case, his enemy is, is God, right? So, in humans, we should try to get as many humans as, as, as possible without losing them to our father which is down below in hell or to Satan, something like that. So that's the whole thing. So, one thing, uh, so many uh, interesting points, but one thing he, he talks about is about prayer. Especially what um, touched me was the devil um, giving advice to the nephew says that God is we are in danger of the enemy that is God especially when humans are praying we are in danger of the immediate attack of the enemy when humans are praying he is cynically indifferent when humans pray that's what he says he is cynically uh, in indifferent to the dignity of his position so and here we see Paul, Paul and Peter saying that our, that our prayers may not be hindered. Lest, so, because God, um, there's a spiritual um, something that we lose and a fellowship from God when we do something on, on, on a material things and we don't um, have a right relationship. Where, um, so, Satan will take advantage when we don't forgive one another or when we don't respect uh, or in our family there's no peace so that Satan can take advantage of our lives but when we are fully connected with God in prayer there is a shield around us C.S. Lewis says that for some people there is always a cloud that we cannot even approach them the devils cannot approach there is constant cloud around them. Around them. That is, they are always continuously in the presence of the Lord in prayer. That uh, the devil cannot touch them. Or give them any kind of... Um, um, put them down. He gives many interesting things. He also says that humans are amphibians. <laughs> That's very interesting. The reason why I'm telling is, in this book of Nehemiah, as we continue to read, there are so many attacks, direct attacks, and um, indirect attacks, hiring uh, people. And you can see their hatred. Chapter 4, verse 7 says, And it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth. So they were not able to bear that God's children are rebuilding the walls and securing themselves. That our enemy was not able to bear it. They were wroth. They hated. Even we see here. So one thing we have to see is, first thing is we have to realize that this is a spiritual warfare. We are in, in the war field. First we should believe that we have enemies. <coughs> that we have to deal with, especially God's children. I was talking about humans are amphibians. He says, he gives another advice to his nephew, to Wormwood, saying that, they are half spiritual and half um, flesh, okay, earthly. So, and they go through some ups and downs in their life. Okay, sometimes they're in the high, always praise the Lord, and um, I'm so happy, I'm excited. That's the high. And then they go through the trough. That's everything is like very dull and. Very, uh, I don't know. 
how is life <laughs> yeah it's very de depressing and all <laughs> so so that's so what the uh, he gives advice is the, the his nephew wants to attack them wherein the high because everything is high for them right that's when he wants to tempt them but he says don't worry about the high when they are really high uh, they have their physical attraction everything high but, but they also have like very um, they they can also protect themselves or they they can also resist themselves because everything is high they can resist temptation also everything is high they so no 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 god is like i cannot betray my god so something like that right so i love my god i'll do everything for god but when they are in in the low period of their lives that's when when they're dragging that's when attack their mind give them thoughts foolish thoughts all kinds of things attack them and tempt them so many other interesting things that we see how um, the devil actually um, hates us secretly the bible says in first peter peter says in 5 um, 6 i think be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion is seeking to devour to eat up why does the devil actually why does satan actually try to attack people god's people if if uh, if he knows that um, uh, they are god's children and um, they are secured forever why does satan even attack um, a, go a child of god if he knows that there is no um, there is no success for him right but he must have trapped so many of god's people so called god's people he must have truly taken them captive to himself or his um, servants so we see throughout these chapters that san balat is trying to attack god's children and toby are also giving um, various kinds of um, advices and geshem also doing trying to do the same so let's um, look at um, the gates so we here we see 10 gates <clears throat> the gates represent actually the gates represent god's presence enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise psalm 100 verse 5 says right jesus in john 10 verse 7 says i am the door i am the gate or in other words the gate represents our experience our encounter with the lord so with that in mind let's see uh, all of these quickly here the first gate that we see here is the sheep gate there is a slide but i don't think uh, you need a slide it's okay I mean, the sheep gate is the first gate where sheep gate signifies <clears throat> our relationship with the lord that he is the lamb of god that he died for you and me and through his death that we are also delivered and redeemed and um, we have this beautiful relationship with god the, that's the first gate and also that's the last gate in our spiritual life as we walk through our spiritual life journey when we are almost to the end of our spiritual life again we have to come back to the basics that your salvation is entirely dependent upon the work finished work of what our lord has done on the cross there is nothing that you can merit take credit for second one is the fish gate once you become a believer with the lord you <clears throat> share the joy of evangelism you go out and preach <coughs> trying to serve the lord 
The, th the, old the third one is the old gate. I'm just going quickly because of time, but you can do more study on all the different gates and what spiritually it could mean to um, a believer. Is the old gate is take the old paths of the Lord. Of what? Let's read one verse. For old gate, actually. I think in Jeremiah chapter. Um, take the old paths of the Lord. I don't remember the verse, but I think it's Jeremiah chapter 16. Anyone happen to know that? Okay, so that's fine. So, God's ways are already established. We don't need something new for our spiritual uh, walk with the Lord. The fourth one is the valley gate. Once a believer receives God's promises and God's salvation, as he continues his walk with the Lord, he is not just left there, but he will be tried and tested and he will go through not only the, the joy of the law and the joy refreshing, but also he will go through a, a valley experience in his life. Sometimes it will be for a great length of period that he will go through different difficult situations while God is um, training him and training him and teaching him but that's where actually a believer will bear great fruit he will um, come to a maturity when he goes through this valley experience with the Lord and the fifth one is the dung gate after he goes through trials and temptations and testings with the, he will know the Lord more and then he goes through this gate where all the filth all his sins and all uh, his um, his character is changed and transformed. Ephesians also says, talking about this Romans chapter five, it's related to that, right? Romans chapter five, verse um, two onwards says, "By whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations." Knowing that tribulations work at patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope make it not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. As we go through this tribulations, and path of tribulations, God builds and molds our character and virtues. After this, when God cleanses us, from all our impurities through trials and God refines us we see this fountain gate where he fills us with the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit John 7 38 says let's read John 7 38 talking about this Holy Spirit And he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of his belly shall flow a fountain of living water, bearing much fruit. After this, the seventh gate is the water gate, which relates to God's word, which cleanses us, sanctify, uh, sanctifying us. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 talking about with the washing of the water which is thy word God washes us and a believer hides God's words in his hearts and he builds his life upon God's promises after this he goes on to the next gate that is the horse gate the eighth one is the horse gate that is the horse gate is in a spiritual life, it is where a believer will stand against the wiles of the devil as a, in, in a warfare where he fights the battles. 
as how a horse is used in the battlefield, a believer, with the strength of the Lord, he will fight the battle that is before him and he overcomes them through the weapons that are available to, to him. So this enemy, we should understand the nature of the enemy, we should understand how he attacks us. Only then we can counter-attack. If you have a sword and um, somebody will come with a machine gun, can you handle him? Right? You cannot uh, handle him. You can come with a sword and you can do, you can shout, but um, he will just shoot you with the gun and you'll die. So you need the right weapon. You re need the right weapon to attack the devil and the enemy. We can't use physical weapons for spiritual um, warfare. So the enemy comes um, and discourages us saying, um, saying that um, look at your life, look at the future. Your future is not uns is certain. Two years from now, nothing is certain. You don't know where you will be. You will be here or you will be in India or like, or what happens to your visa. <clears throat> but God tells us to think about the present. But your enemy will come and tell to think about the future. Once you start yielding to, your, to the enemy, what happens is you cannot do the work of the Lord. But once you trust in God's word, then God will supply your daily needs according to the riches in Christ Jesus. From the Father of lights, from whom there is no variableness nor turning, that he provides us. He is your Father. Cast a burden upon the Lord, for he shall sustain thee. He, shall, he cares for you. He is just so many promises from God's word. So we need to use the right tools. We can't use physical tools. We need to use spiritual tools. The Bible says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the flesh. We do not war with our fleshly weapons. We cannot um, attack the devil with our fleshly um, things. We need to go and use the right weapons. Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the flesh. For our weapons of for our weapons are not for our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Mighty. The Greek word that's used is dynamo. Even if you have a machine gun, but if you come with a dynam dynamite, you can destroy a whole group of people, right? So that says the Greek word is dynamite. The dynamo or, or, or mighty through the God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. The enemy attacks your mind. The only way to overcome is with the power of God and through prayer. That you can have a cloud around you. All the battles are won before. When you come to God in prayer, you already won your battle or you lost your battle if you don't pray. So here what I'm encouraging you all is to fight the good fight of faith. And know your enemy. Look at his strategies and use the weapon of prayer. Use the blood of Jesus Christ, which can give us overcoming power, which can cleanse us from all our guilty conscience, which can cleanse, which has the blood of Jesus Christ has power to cleanse us from all our sins, all our unrighteousness. And the Bible says that, and they have overcome them by the blood of the Lamb. And use the privilege that is available to us, that is prayer, that our God immediately acts. When we pray, that's what the Bible says, that we are shielded with His presence. The Bible tells us that's the reason why pray always. Pray always without ceasing. So that we are always in the presence of the Lord. So that all the evil thoughts that come from the devil and from our flesh 
like Tobia, giving all kinds of, he was outside externally, he was saying that God is good and gives all kinds of ideas, but it always opposes the work of the Lord. Our old nature always is in opposition of our spiritual life. He is right against what we want to do, our spirit wants to do, he is against it. The flesh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is not willing. So we have to be cognizant, we have to be aware of the schemes of the devil so that we can fight the war, the warfare uh, with power of the Lord. So once we are victorious, then we have this great hope in, when we go to the East Gate. That's where the East Gate represents the coming of the Lord. Let's read this, Ezekiel chapter 44, 1 to 3. This is a great and beautiful hope that we have for God's children. Somebody read Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 1 to 3. Yeah. Yes, here we see the experience of knowing that God is going to come from this place, from the East Gate, or in other words, that uh, believing and knowing that our Lord is going to come back, the hope of the day of the Lord. And when He comes, He is going to give us according to, He is going to give us rewards according to what we have done for Him. That's where like He, he is going to inspect us, that's where the inspection gate is the last one. Again, 31 talks about the sheep gate. So again, our spiritual life and walk is always related to the work of Christ, that what he has done for us. So here in, in this um, passage we see people um, doing many things to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Um, people did many things. But we also see some people not doing anything. The nobles in chap chapter 3 verse 5 says, but not their next uh, verse five, and chapter five, verse five says, chapter three, verse five says, and next unto them, the Tekoites repaid, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. So we see some people not doing any work, but we should not be like them. We should be um, doing what we can, contributing to the work of the Lord. Let's read some. Um, few verses from um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 28 uh, sorry 15 verse 58 therefore my brethren beloved my beloved brethren be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord your labor is not in vain in the Lord Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap if you faint not. <coughs> also Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10 talks about same thing. For, for beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your love, your work and labor of love, which ye have shewed towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. So God is not unrighteous. Let us not be weary. <coughs> Let us not be tired in doing service to the Lord. In due time you will reap the harvest. So when God um, inspects us and gives us rewards, when he comes back on the day of the Lord. So here one thing we can see is these people worked without any force. They did it voluntarily. Right? Nehemiah, Nehemiah 
uh, had this vision of rebuilding the walls. He said, let us rise and build. And they did it voluntarily, not by force or compulsion. The second thing is, what they did is, they built first closer to their home itself. It says in some places that some of the people repaired their, uh, in front of their home it says, some people repaired their neighbor's uh, wall that was broken. So God's work is not something that you have to go somewhere and do it. God provides different um, uh, things for us to do. What we need is a willing and an obedient heart and God gives us a lot of opportunity to serve Him. As long as we are um, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, your names will be um, as a memorial for eternity because God is a God who keeps record of our work. God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. And they all did it as a team. Teamwork. So teamwork is important. So as a church, Bible tells us that each one, God has given for every individual member a unique gift. That we all together can grow and be perfected. Let's read before we close Ephesians chapter 4. <coughs> Verse... Um, 11 says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's um, take these um, few points, how the people of Jerusalem together voluntarily really they, they, they built in times of strong opposition. So what they did was they were seeking God's help and protection while they were praying. Some people were praying and some people were building the wall. So they can so the God was answering their prayer. So through the power of God they were able to secure their salvation. We as God's children also has a responsibility to make sure and secure your calling and election is sure. Don't think that I am chosen before the foundations of the world so I don't have to do anything. God has given you a responsibility. So through you, He is going to continue the work of the ministry. Okay? So don't, um, uh, soul winning, I went to one um, lady, old lady, and then uh, me and uh, David were there and we opened the door and we were asking David actually, or maybe I don't remember, uh, I think he is very fast, he asked, are you born again? And then she said, uh, uh, did you receive, uh, did you accept? Or she immediately said, no, I didn't receive, I didn't accept anything. God has chosen me before the foundation. I didn't do anything, she said. <laughs> There's nothing that we can talk. She was just saying, God has elected me, God has chosen me, and you don't have to talk to me. <laughs> she just didn't, didn't even open the door <coughs> fully. So we were like, I was just like, <laughs> couldn't do, didn't talk much because she's telling everything. By grace I'm saved, I'm chosen, I'm elected, there's nothing I can do. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Uh, but like we have to have a balance. The scripture is very balanced. Okay, God also is all-knowing, sovereign. At the same time, we have a part that He's so loving that He will hold us and make us do things together as a, how a small child. For a small child, like Ivan, right? He's uh, he he doesn't know how to write an A or a B, but um, we hold his hand and write an A and a B and a C. Okay. So Shalini will write A, B, C, and then he will, when, when I come back home, he will say, Daddy, look what I have done. A, B, C, I have written A, B, C. <laughs> so, right, it's like that. God, through His Spirit, through His nature, through His goodness that flows through us, will make us work, and finally, it's He that has done everything, but He will give us again um, all the good things for us. So, God is good. 
And sometimes we don't understand so many things, but uh, one thing is sure, that God is good all the time. All things work together for our good, to them that love God, and to them who are called according to His purpose. So let us um, fight the spiritual warfare, knowing the enemy's strategy, like how Paul said, for we are well aware of the schemes of the devil. So he's saying that, let me forgive everybody whom I owe that I should forgive, I will forgive. So that our, the ministry is not hindered. So that Satan will not take advantage of. So even in our spiritual life, we have to, we have to give so much importance to prayer, so much importance to spiritual things, that Satan will take advantage. And he will pull you, and he will devour you, and he'll eat you up if you don't use the right weapon. That's what I want to say here is um, to let us fight because our enemy hates us. Many people will think that Satan is, um, is very good, um, gives us so many things. <laughs> so let's pray. Dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for giving us this time. Lord, help us to fight the battle with your power, O oh Lord. Help us, Lord, to run to you for your strength, O oh Lord. The enemy fears when we kneel down. It trembles when your saint, O oh Lord, when your child prays and looks unto you for help, O oh Lord. That there is a shield that protects your children, O oh Lord, when we approach you. And your response is immediate when we pray. Then we can stand against the devil from the power that comes from above, from the tools that we can use, Lord. We pray that give us, this church, Lord, um, a fresh um, commitment, Lord, to, to fight the battle and to be victorious and to build our walls strong so that our salvation is secure, so that our gates are uh, open to experience, Lord, your presence and your joy. Commit all of us into your loving hands. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.